Pastor's Roundtable this morning on News Radio 1310.com and News Radio 1310 KLIX. First time I think I've ever given the website out first. Although corporate was here the other day reminding us that's an important uh, aspect of what we do. So I uh, just wanted to pass that along. And of course, if you wanted to hear the pastors too, and you're not necessarily near a radio, why don't you download the app for your smartphone? And that way you could listen to them not only online, but over the app uh, too as well. So there's a News Radio 1310. KLIX app. We're at 38. It's uh, almost seven minutes after nine o'clock. Uh, joining us in studio, uh, Pastor Chris Volkerts, Pastor Paul Thompson, and Pastor Bear Morton, and uh, Bill Colley with you too. I'll be handling the telephones today at 208-736-0300. And today's topic is the Constitution. No, 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 no. That was a few weeks ago. Uh, that took up an entire show. We're going to have Bear quote the Constitution for us. <laughs> By memory. Uh, yeah. <laughs> There's an old segment of Barney Five trying to do that. Yeah, on that. It is hilarious, too. <laughs> <It is. laughs> what comes next? Uh, hey, I just wanted to point out, we have so much going on on both uh, the national level and uh, the state level on issues that really impact Christians. And we were just talking off air uh, about the the bill that was proposed about an abortion ban in Idaho, which... We still don't see a lot of action on, and and I know that there's an effort among pastors around the state to encourage action, but slow going still. Yeah, is every every indication we get that this uh, this bill, the Idaho Abortion Human Rights Act, is still sitting on the desk of Representative Harris's uh, office, and it's not been assigned a a committee yet. It's his committee. But it's not been assigned a reading or a hearing at this point. And so, you know, the, the timeline is ticking for the legislative season. Um, somewhat, you could you could probably begin to guess that there's some strategic waiting purposefully so we don't have to deal with it this year, put it off till next year, and maybe we won't have to talk about it then. So it's it's really, uh, right now, it's just it's just a waiting game. Well, I, from my perspective, Paul, it's, it's it's a typical political game. It is. Let's just see what the rest of the country is going to do, and then then we'll kind of join in. Right. Listen, we live in a state of Idaho. Right. They, they just need to buck up and, and get the thing going. Right. Pretty I simple, totally agree yeah. with you. Yeah. And I think people always appreciate when their leaders lead. Right. You know, rather yeah. than just waiting to see which way the wind is blowing, we want our leaders to lead. And wouldn't that be great if Idaho is the first state to ban abortion? I think we, yeah. wouldn't we would cheer. Yeah. yeah. We're, we're not alone, though, because there are some other states that are now considering these bans. I've been reading about them the last few weeks, and nobody is shy about saying, yes, this is what we believe in. And so that's what catches me by surprise, because we supposedly live in one of the most conservative and Christian and faithful states in the Union. You know, if, if you were looking for a comparison, the accent is different here, but we're not a lot, really, Mississippi, Alabama, Arkansas are a lot like Idaho. Right, I think the values are 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 strong across the nation. There, they certainly are pockets where there's I mean, obviously. W- what kind of a state could it be that, that decides they're going to abort a child up to full term, full term, or even let the baby die on a table if it if it somehow survives miraculously by the grace of God and attempted abortion? That any state would say we're going to go ahead and let the baby die. So there's pockets of that kind of craziness. Uh, inhumane, inconceivable actions. But largely, I think the nation has still has value over life. And so m- maybe a state like Idaho might help wake up the nation. And, and instead of being a state that says, let's wait and see what everybody else does, why not be the state? Th- this is one of the reasons why people want to move to Idaho. So why not lead like that now? Man, that's one of my I got a lot of fire in my belly today, and it's not because I had burritos for lunch. Uh, and you also were on a on a on a Christian show uh, just the other day up in the Panhandle. Yeah, uh, some guys uh, up there in in is it Moscow or Moscow? You know, the whole way up there, I was training my wife and myself to say Moscow, and every time someone told us where they were, they would they used the word Moscow. So I don't really don't know which it is, but I was in Moscow. 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 <laughs> and a full day's drive, we should point out, It too. was, yeah. And and what a beautiful section of the state to drive through as well. But, yeah, Cross Politic was the, the program I was on, and we it was essentially to talk about this very bill right here. And, again, uh, the, the, the number of pastors that you are seeing signing up still growing? Still growing. Uh, 127 pastors now, uh, over 60 cities 
that that's representing. And so we I still have great hope to see many more. There, there's a lot more pastors than 160 in the state. And again, you also have lists up uh, for petitions for men and women, too. Right, right. And both of those, all three of those are growing. And I just continue to encourage anyone to go to paulthompsonblog.com. Both of those statements are listed there. And uh, read it and think about it. And if you're in agreement with it, sign it. And uh, we, we, I hope to have an opportunity to hand deliver these to our legislators. The other day, uh, speaking of uh, legislation in Washington at the national level, there was a uh, a bill that's twice now, I guess, Ben Sass uh, from Nebraska has proposed this bill, uh, born again, or, or born, excuse me, I know I'm talking to pastors here. <laughs> <laughs> right. but, we uh, like born again. Yeah. Uh, the, the Born Alive Protection Act. Uh, it's funny, though, because the Washington Post characterize it, uh, characterizes it as an anti-abortion bill, but this is about what happens after an abortion that does not work where the baby is still alive, it would the doctor would be instructed, you've got to care for this child now. And it got defeated uh, because they didn't quite get to the votes they needed to move it to the full vote. I mean, they, did, they had to get to 60 votes. And even with three Democrats breaking ranks, it didn't make it. I, I don't know how, how, how anybody could sit here and, and, and think to themselves that, that certain legislators, I, that this is unconscionable, I, that anybody would support this practice. Yeah, <clears throat> yeah, you know, they're spinning out of control. This is sin begetting sin, and it's one of those things where it continues to happen, and it flies, in, I mean, it's going quick here, yeah. gentlemen. It, it is something that is some, that they herald. I mean, they don't even get it. I mean, when you go to the hospitals, you it's one of your rights to be able to be treated. And here you have a baby that comes and, and is botched, like you said, uh, but yet it's still a living, and we're going to look there and say, no, I want my, my choice to overcome that. Right. And so it, it is horrendous. It is murder. It is it's flat out wrong. And we expect God's punishment upon that. Don't, yeah. don't be sitting back and say, okay, well, that's good for them. Listen, it is coming and it's already here. Expect it. Judgment is happening now. Yeah, yeah. The indignation of God is, is on its way. And, and it is present in the, in, in the very breathing moment we're in right now. I, uh, I just was looking this over, in fact. And it's not just the people in politics who... Think that this this practice would be okay? Uh, I came across this. This is actually mentions that uh, the the newspaper coverage was this headline: Trump and Republicans are trying to paint Democrats as radical on abortion. I don't know how more radical you can be than killing a child outside the womb. Oh, yeah. And uh, number two, there was a story this morning. I happened to see uh, a young woman is giving an interview where she says she went to a Planned Parenthood. It was in Detroit or Chicago. I don't remember the city now exactly. And uh, she started asking questions. What happens if my baby is born alive? And um, the doctor said, well, I'll break its neck. And it instantly turned this young lady into a pro-life uh, uh, yeah. human being. And she oh, just decided, yeah. I've got to have this baby. Uh, so we're dealing with, and then this comes from, it's, it's not just politicians. Uh, a writer by the name of David Hassani writing at a website called The Federalist decided to count up how many mentions there were of uh, this vote on certain news networks. He couldn't mm. find any mentions of it. Was, right. CNN didn't cover it at all. Imagine that. Um, NBC or MSNBC, no coverage. Uh, uh, ABC News, he writes nothing. So it just it just didn't happen according to these people. It, it just right. paid so, so no when, attention. When does life begin, gentlemen? When does it begin? Are we going right. to determine that hours after a birth that that's not life? And that we have the choice now, and that's not murder. I mean, this is just right. ludicrous. It really right. is. It really is. The, the The definition of life itself is really still at question here, because obviously, if they're if they're considering that this is something I can go home and sleep tonight because I let a living, breathing baby die in my presence, then obviously they're not thinking. They're not. They're not logically thinking. They're not biblically thinking. They're not godly thinking at all. You know, I appreciate that Ben Sass has brought this this bill forward. And I appreciate the fact that there are Republicans who are are outraged against this great tragedy, you know, that we can have full-term abortion. But I, I'm somewhat disturbed at the hypocrisy I see among the Republicans that now they're all activated and worked up over this abortion where as long as the baby's in the womb, it was okay. Right. Yeah. You know, yeah. why, right. why aren't, where's right. the outrage when the baby's at 20 weeks at or conceive, at four at weeks? Conception. At conception. Where's that outrage? And... You know, praise God if this is what it takes for 
the conservatives and the Christians in our nation to wake up and do something about it. But uh, I think it's high time. You know, it's interesting to me as a pastor, you know, being called to the hospital and and dealing with um, individuals that have lost a baby in their womb. And, and you talk about the heartache in that. I mean, those people are looking at that, the, the, the anticipation of life. And, and, of course, that baby was alive in the womb. And so how we go about as a pastor going through there and, and, and trying to help our loved ones, people in our churches, to, to deal with that is, yeah. uh, it, it doesn't make sense to me. You know, I had a recent conversation with a woman who has had an abortion. And she's, she's pretty worked up about this too and, and encouraging us pastors to do what we can to, to push this bill forward in Idaho. But, but she was saying, don't just fight uh, for the unborn, mm-hmm. But, mm-hmm. but fight for the women right. who w- would have or will have an abortion. She says, there's no statistics and there's no follow-up for a woman who has an right, abortion. Right, right. And, and she knows by experience that after that you descend into a great pit of despair and darkness. And right. she said, you need to fight for the women. That's good. Yep, and to some degree we get that with our churches, right? Right. Because the heart it is going to break down in the midst of all that. Who can carry that guilt? That's who can right. who can fly that flag and say, you know what, I got my choice here when the reality when birthdays come around or the thought of that comes around. The guilt of that and it's just heavy. And and like you say, Chris, it um, the gospel gives us uh, an opportunity to be able to, to extend uh, that truth of grace of Christ, and, and so it's a beautiful thing to see people realize that I've, I've committed sin, but but I got a Savior who's going to forgive me. That's right. And redeem my soul, and so that's significant. And so the statistics are, are in our churches, and we, we get right. that after the fact, yeah. and, and we see the devastation of what that looks like, and and. And, uh, but you're right. It's, it's not in an ad. It's, it's all about what the woman wants and the, and the lifestyle that she desires to that day. Right. Yeah. I mean, the world preaches you can sin without consequences, yeah. right? But, but women know, why is it that, and maybe this was experienced with your wife, or it, how many women out there have had a miscarriage? Why did they go through grieving when they have a miscarriage? Because they know, that was my child. Yeah. That was my right. child. Right. And, and so when a woman has an abortion... They've been taught that this is just a collection of cells, and we're not going to humanize it. We're going to call it a fetus. And we have all these these words and these games that we play to get around the fact that we're dealing with a human being. And uh, so when a woman goes through an abortion, she knows. She knows immediately a life has just been taken. Right. A human being that's created in the image of God. And that's significant to know that this is something that this is God wrought. You and I can't can't just have babies. It's something that, that God's got to open the womb and allow things to happen. And so, conception of life, Scripture tells us, happens at conception. And so, that's right. It's one of those things where God's hands on. Yeah, exactly. You know, you even stop and think about how, in certain legislators, they want to leave the the window open for abortion for cases like incest or rape, and they'll they'll couch it in the sense that we were being friendly to the to the woman because how dare us say that a woman who was raped has to carry a child to birth and and yet we're not even thinking about that woman who's not only been raped now but also at some point is going to have to deal with the fact that she's taken the life of a baby we've got to get to a break uh, we've got more coming up on pastor's roundtable on news radio 1310 klix and news radio 1310.com uh joining us in the studio pastors bear morton chris folkerts and paul thompson uh bill collie handling the telephones this morning on news radio 1310 klix Wanted to mention uh, Pastor's Roundtable this morning on News Radio 1310, KLIX, and News Radio 1310.com. Pastors Paul Thompson, Bear Morton, and Chris Fokertz joining us in the studio. We're at 40. It's coming up on 923 and Bill Colley on News Radio 1310. And uh, I want to mention Magic Valley this morning, too. Uh, hey, I've got a, a quick question. I uh, I have an aunt. Uh, God bless her. She's still with us. And uh, she, uh, she has been a longtime uh, member of the United Methodist Church. Uh, she grew up in a small town, and there were not a lot of options. And I remember when I was a teenager, and then even when I was coming home from college, I would often meet her pastor, who uh, United Methodist Church is one of those mainline denominations that has had, an, I think, an identity crisis over the course of the last generation. Her pastor I found to be a very traditional Christian pastor. Uh, that was my memories of him. Isn't that funny? You call it traditional. Let's just call it biblical. Biblical. Mm-hmm. Biblical is a good word for that. Yeah. yeah. And uh, and uh, and and so, 
you've got this, they were trying to, I think, come up with a, 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 this week at their convention, the notion that they would have distinct paths, but they would all remain under the yeah. umbrella of United right. Methodist Church. Right. And uh, it, it didn't go well because those biblical people yeah. Yeah. said no. Right. Uh, they, did, they were not going to approve of, and a small story, uh, I interviewed, he used to be a regular guest on a talk show that I had about 15 years ago, a fellow named Harry Freeman Jones, uh, who, who was married to a man in a United Methodist Church way back in the early 1970s. And so this has been going on in that denomination. Now, the church does not apparently officially recognize this, but it is still going on to this day. And this is what this, uh, this was all about this past week. It finally came to a head. Right. Um, what's the future of a denomination like that that cannot come to some sort of an agreement on what the Bible actually says, or with some people saying we should probably just push it aside? Yeah. Well, it, it's hard to know today. It, it appears, everything appears, for, I guess, I'm, let me back up. I was surprised that they voted to go with the holding the biblical standard, which that's a tragedy on my part, that I didn't think they would actually vote that way, but they did. And so probably it, it appears that the next step is, a, is an eventual split in the denomination because there's such an almost an even split amongst the denomination of those who want to embrace homosexuality, gender fluidity, and all kinds of other sinful activities and, and have them sanctified or sanctioned by the church. And then this strong conservative biblical position, which which I think is largely by the numbers, is made up by the United Methodist out of Africa that actually preserved the sanctity of the United Methodist denomination. Yeah, that was a very historic point, really because was. I think you're right, Paul. I, I was thinking the same thing. I, we see with our eyes, and we see what America's doing, and what these mainline denominations are embracing. And, and for that to, and I think that they were shocked. Yeah. Uh, just reading some of the commentary, I think they were shocked at the fact that we didn't get our deal. I, I, let's just back up a little bit further. For the United Methodists to say, you know what, you can be autonomous, but yet still be part of our denomination, and you can do whatever you want. I mean, it, it is just gobbledygook. It is. There, there is nothing to stand on. So what are you going to stand on? Are you going to stand on the truth or not? Right. And if you're going to call you a Christian, you better stand on the scriptures. Or else you're not a Christian. Right, right. The, that, that, that idea that we're going to let those who want to do this do that and those who don't not do that and still be, remain under the same uh, authority of the denomination, it really proved itself that that was the weakest and would have been the most foolish direction to go. So bless the Lord. They yeah. chose to go yeah. biblical. Yeah, I just hope that they're calling... They're calling it sin, like, and again, too, maybe this is a bit of a skeptical spirit on my part, but how much are they saying, well, if we, if we go with the LGBTQ movement, we risk splitting the church, so we're going to try to go the traditional route, not biblical, but, you know, in this case, just stick with what is traditional. You know, are, are, they, are they holding course because they say this is righteousness, or are they just trying to kind of keep the peace? If they're, you know, if they're trying to keep the peace... It's not gonna. It's not gonna work. Yeah, Chris. A little bit I read. Um, it was more about about the, keeping biblical? the biblical truth. Right. Good and, for them. And, and you think about it, John Wesley starting that movement, and, and and how biblical. If you read any of his sermons and his desires, um, I don't buy. Truth is eternal. I don't buy that culture determines what truth is, and neither do you guys. And so it's one of those right. things where this is the eternal word of God, and, and it doesn't matter what culture or society that we're in, it is going to stand, and it is our guideline. It's our problem line. It is our truth. That's right. And, and so for any of that to, to kind of waver, I'm, I'm surprised you even have a vote on this stuff. Right. Maybe that's, that's right. why I'm not a part of a denomination. <laughs> well, you know, it, 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 we've already seen schism because you've got Southern Methodists, United Methodists, and the Wesleyans don't even call themselves Methodists in the right. name anymore. So, you know, it, it wouldn't be a surprise, but People ha are at liberty to create their own denomination if you're not happy with the way things go. Right. But if they were to walk away, then they lose church property most likely. And it oh, seems yes. to me that's why they don't want to say, okay, we have a new, we're going to, we're going to cleave and have a new, a new church because then you have to actually put up a new building. Right. That's and that's the that's the the nature of a denomination like the United Methodist, where the the denomination owns the physical property and the buildings. Uh, they're they're not autonomous. They are not independent churches. And so there that has to be that that path has to be uncovered along the way when you decide I don't want to be like that anymore. So now what are you going to do? Are, are you going to uh, uh, 
put barriers around your building and say, no, this is my building and not yours. It's an unknown next step for the denomination. You know, and reading a little bit more about this, that there's even a, a talk about this conservative stance stand because they're going to add 13 more conservative delegates. Right. And so you, you can almost see the wheels turn. And even as we're speaking, that they're trying to figure out what do we do and, and do we leave our buildings uh, what, you know, all that kind of this stuff. This was actually a last-ditch effort by the liberal components because this was actually a special called meeting. This That's was right. not even one of their yep. their regular every four-year meetings. And so they, they actually saw this coming. And so let's plan a meeting now because we might be able to do this. They, they're not going to be able to do this if they continue to grow on the conservative side. We've got to take another break. Uh, I've got to mention Todd Starnes is on the way. Pastor's Roundtable this morning until 10 a.m. on KLIX. Uh, pastors uh, Chris Fokertz, Bear Morton, and Paul Thompson uh, joining me, Bill Colley, in the studio. It's 39 coming up on 930, and do want to remind you, too, as well, if you've got a question or comment for the pastors after the break, 208-736-0300. That's 208-736-0300. Uh, we wanted to point out Pastor's Roundtable this morning on News Radio 1310, KLIX and News Radio 1310.com. Uh, the music uh, does not relate in any way to the. I'm the good time. I'm the good last one. Like I, you know, riding on a horse. I mean, that's something that the American dream. And uh, it's 9:34. With the Bible uh, in your hand, you know George, George Whitfield did that. The circuit preached rider, off his. Yeah. Yes. Sounds like I'm gonna ask my job. church for a horse allowance. Uh, you also get to see the world. Uh, we're at 40, and uh, joining us in the studio, pastors Bear Morton, Chris Fokerts, and Paul Thompson. Uh, Bill Colley handling the telephones. And uh, well, we've got a lot to talk about yet, and probably we don't have enough time today. It's a good thing we have to do this next week again, so yes. we'll get back to more of this. But uh, Paul mentioned uh, during the break, uh, the president last week, he made an announcement. He's going to, I guess it's through some federal title something program, but he's going to defund some efforts of Planned Parenthood in order to protect innocent life. Planned Parenthood, by the way, not happy about this. Right. No, it's the it's it, it's a... It's an act or a, a presidential position that the last was enacted through President Reagan, and that was a defunding of any agency that provides abortions on site at the clinic where they provide health care at the same time. So essentially, uh, you know, and I'm not, I'm not an expert upon what, what this is yet. I don't know what the complete fallout is, but as I understand it is that any, any Planned Parenthood or any agency that performs abortions at the clinic where they also provide health care, that they can no longer perform abortions at that on-site place, that they would actually have to have a different location for the, the, the abortions to take place. So thus, and perhaps best as I, as I would look at it in this case, that in the city of Twin Falls, where Planned Parenthood exists is where they do their health care and it's where they do their abortions, that under this new act that uh, the president has just put in place of cutting 50 or $60 million going to Planned Parenthood, that they would then have to have a second location to actually perform the, the abortions. So, you know, I, I think that that's a, that's a good step in this direction and maybe even is a foothold in the community where the church needs to stay awake today. Don't fall asleep, church. Uh, that we need to make sure that our city council knows that we don't want a place that is designated for the murdering of babies in our city. Right now, we do have one of those places. By the grace of God, may this give us the opportunity to communicate we don't want it. We were also having a conversation off air very quickly, too, about the Bladensburg Cross, right. the, the War Memorial, which is in Maryland, just outside of Washington, D.C. Uh, Supreme Court heard arguments about this yesterday, and it appears the justices, I think, are going to rule in favor of the cross staying up, but they're not going to be ruling uh, because it's a Christian uh, symbol, uh, because it was one of the justices, Breyer, who's one of the liberal justices, said, he even said it doesn't have any biblical inscription on it. Uh, so they're looking for um, a, a way out on this one where they can essentially allow it to stand because they know if you say this has got to come down, this is going to create problems all across the country. Yeah. Yeah, the problem is, is they want to, I think they want to keep the cross, you know, um, but they want to say it's not a religious symbol. Because they kind of there again too. They're maybe testing the winds here in America, but everybody knows it's a Christian symbol, right? Right. I mean that's 
that's so obvious. I, I read an interesting book a while back about the Underground Railroad of Christians fleeing North Korea. And they don't flee, flee south to South Korea, they flee north to China. And there's an Underground Railroad throughout China, and the North Koreans are, are told essentially this, look for the building with a cross on it, and mm -hmm. there you will find help. Look for the building with a cross on it. I mean, that is the universal symbol of Christianity. Right. I, I was going to say uh, that the, the court is thinking to itself, and they may, many of them, very much support the symbolism, but they, they have to have a decision, and, and let's face it, they're no different than a lot of people. They're testing which way the wind is blowing, and they're looking for a safe way out of this one. What, without making a statement. What they may need to be doing is have their ear for the rumble of motorcycles because, you know, you get the, the motorcycle riding veterans of America that, that are going to show up in a moment like this, and they'll need to be listening for that rumble to show up. <laughs> <laughs> well, there's, a, there's an old movie with Robert Duvall, uh, I think, called The Apostle. It's, it's not necessarily a very nice <clears throat> movie. He, he, he accidentally, in a fit of rage, kills someone, but... A guy comes to bulldoze his church, and he puts the Bible down in front of the bulldozer, and the guy suddenly realizes what he's doing and stops. There would be an effort made to stop anyone from coming in and knocking down this monument, and that's what they want to avoid because you would be looking at hundreds to thousands of these situations happening across the country. Yeah, I remember a story out of Boise where a guy coming in, I think from Chicago, somewhere outside of Boise, right. flying in, always seeing the lit-up cross. By the way, that has very significant um, truth to me. Not only is it a symbol of sacrifice, but it's also a place where I, I proposed to my wife at the foot mm. of that cross. And But yet here he was, I'm offended every time I fly into Boise. And it's just one of those things where, come on. And of course, Boise still has it. They right. still right. is Bless lit. The Lord. Yeah. We've got more coming up on Pastor's Roundtable. It's 20 minutes from 10 o'clock. Uh, joining us in the studio, Pastors Paul Thompson, Chris Folkerts, and Bear Morton. Bill Colley on uh, News Radio 1310 KLIX. Wanted to point out you're listening to News Radio 1310 KLIX and News Radio 1310.com. Joining us in the studio, uh, Pastors Paul Thompson, Chris Folkerts, and Bear Morton, and uh, Bill Colley, too. Uh, I'm here until 10, as are the, uh, the pastors. We're at 40 at 943 on Magic Valley this morning. And, you know, we haven't even asked the three of you yet where your churches are located. People listening, perhaps for the very first time. Uh, might be wondering a bit about that, especially if they're newcomers and they're looking for a church. Yeah, I, Bear Morton, pastor Magic Valley Bible Church, 204 Main Avenue North on the corner of Gooding and Main. Our services start on Sunday at 9 o'clock. We have Sunday school after that. We call it Dig Deep Institute, and um, we're going through some counseling, how to apply the Bible to the life, and uh, some neat things happening at our church. Um, so children's ministry on Wednesdays, feeding the outreach. Uh, anybody want a free meal on Tuesday? Uh, Bible studies, you guys have got all that too. Yeah, great. And Paul Thompson at Eastside Baptist Church, 204 Eastland Drive North here in Twin Falls. And we gather on Sunday mornings at 9.15 for a morning Bible study, uh, and then 10.30 for our corporate worship service, and then again at 6.30 on Sunday nights. Sure, and Christopher Folkerts, pastor of New Covenant, United Reformed Church. Our worship services are 10 o'clock a.m., and we have a teaching service at 11.45 where we invite people to come with their questions, and uh, we can talk about the message beforehand. And our location is 1306 Filer Avenue East. We uh, had uh, the largest Christian denomination on the planet have a large meeting in the past week uh, where they discussed a situation that has gotten completely out of control, and that is not just... Uh, the abuse of minors or even nuns or other people uh, uh, that are in these churches, uh, but also the, uh, the attempts to cover this up over the course of the last several decades, if not centuries perhaps. And uh, in the course of that very same meeting, you had uh, one of the uh, leading uh, associates of the Pope. Uh, he was essentially defrocked. Uh, that was uh, Cardinal McCarrick. And uh, a cardinal from Australia was convicted on a couple of counts of child molestation. So as all this was going on, uh, the, the, the church was having a meeting to discuss uh, exactly what course they should go forward in, in addressing this and maybe you know providing some remedies. But it seems everyone just packed up and flew out of Rome, uh, uh, acknowledging they had a problem but offering no real solutions. Isn't that often the way it goes? I think we 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 understand that when you accept Christ and you submit to him that there will be a cross to carry, it will be personal sacrifice, and 
how often isn't the case that Christians don't want to do the hard and challenging work of rebuking one another, correcting one another, and and disciplining? In the Protestant tradition, at least, we believe that one of the marks of a true church is the exercise of church discipline. A church that does not practice church discipline is not a true and faithful church. It's not a healthy church. It allows sin to fester. Well, and explain a little bit more about that, Chris. You know, church discipline is somebody who is unrepentant in, in their sin, who habitually desires, uh, like adultery, who says, I want my adulteress more than I want my wife. And yet they call, claim themselves to be a Christian. And so church discipline is, is, is God's means to keep the church holy. It is. Discipline is of the same, same root as discipleship. Just as in a family, when a parent disciplines his child, it's not because he wants to kick his child out of the house, but he wants to bring the child close to himself or herself and to restore the relationship. Right. And that's what Paul deals with in Corinthians, where there's a man who's sleeping with his father's wife. And Paul is just outraged. He says, this kind of wickedness isn't even tolerated amongst the pagans, and you guys are accepting this in your church. And he, right. he tells the church to hand the man over to Satan, which is a way of saying, kick him out of the church. Let him see that life in the world is not pleasant. And, and let him see and acknowledge that what he's doing is very sinful. And, and by God's grace, you read 2 Corinthians, and the man repents, and he comes back. And, and Paul himself says, you who have forgiven him, I also forgive. Mm -hmm. And it's a really sweet story. And, and that's the whole point that, that Bear's bringing up, that yeah. discipline is really saying, here's a sin. We don't tolerate that. And, and we invite you and we call and command it's you It's not that to we don't tolerate it. God doesn't God tolerate it. God doesn't tolerate it. You know, the beautiful thing about Matthew 18, Chris, too, is, is, is that God, it's like Nathan to Daniel or to David. He sends, you know, he wants, mm -hmm. you, if you have a sin, you go to them. If they don't repent, you bring somebody. And then if that doesn't happen, I mean, there's, there's multiple chances for this guy to repent and come to his senses. And, and if he's tr a true Christian, he will do that. If he's not, then at the end of it all, you rebuke him and put him out of the church, and you treat him like a tax gatherer. In other words, he, that he's unsaved. Right, and you proceed to evangelize him. Yep. You know, you don't just wash your hands of the affair and let him go, but you, you do pray like the father of the prodigal son. You pray that this guy comes back. Yeah, absolutely. It really is. The whole, the whole aim of it is restoration. And so for a church to recognize there is a problem and not pursue reconciliation, right. they're really not behaving like a church. Or call sin, sin, right? Right, exactly. exactly. So the, we're, we're, you know, everything indicates that there is a significant, serious problem inside of the Church of Rome. And, and everyone outside is certainly seeing it. And we're now hearing that even inside the church, they see it, but they're not dealing with it. I think we're being told right now that about 30 to 40 percent at the low end of Catholic priests are, ho are practicing homosexuals. That is a serious problem. Some figures put it as high, uh, at least at the 70. Vatican, as 80, yeah, yeah. 80 percent. Mercy. Mercy. Yes. And, and, uh, and in a sense, this, you know, it, 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 I remember watching a documentary, lengthy documentary about uh, Martin Luther a few, just a few years ago. And how he was just, and it was a docudrama, so there was an actor playing his role. But as he, he would walk through the Vatican, and he would see the sin, and he would hear people talking about the sin, and, and the fact that many of them uh, were hypocrites in the sense that they would, you know, wink and nod at, at the fact that they were sinning and that they were getting away with it. That's what caused him to say, enough. Right. A and, and yet, we almost see, I think, today... Uh, an acknowledgement of it, but there's like a, a paralysis that, that has seized people. It's all, they don't know, I think, in a matter of how, what they should be doing. They, you know, that, that somebody, this is leadership. You mentioned this earlier, Chris, in the uh, early part of the program. But you need someone suddenly to come forward, and it's got to be, if you've got a designated leader, that leader has to come forward and say, this is the direction we're going. Right. But, but it doesn't seem to be able to, to come to that point to realize what direction that needs to be. Yeah, and then even part of what we're seeing with the United Methodist denomination that you, you have a people who have come forward now and said, no, we we will submit ourselves to the authority of, of the Scripture of God. Time will only tell, but God will bless, even though it appears that there's a great disruption, God will bless those who honor him. Well, I think you put the finger on the nail. Finger on the nail? I'm the nail on the finger. Yeah, that the, too, one of those the, things. Yeah. I usually hit the wig thumb. on the head, something like that. <laughs> All this to say <laughs> is that... Um, you guys made me lose my train of thought. All that to say is that they, they don't have the scriptures as their authority, right? And and so they're trying to sit how how to keep this this huge denomination together. 
And instead of going to the scriptures like the United Methodists, at least some of them did, looked at it and said, this is what God's word says. And that is our authority. And, and, and we'll be judged by that. We are all be judged by the authority and the word of God. There's not a single one that will escape that judgment. Right. Part of the, part of the origin of this, though, is sin, sin occurs when we, when we incorrectly apply God's law. Right. And with regard to the Church of Rome, requiring their priests to take a vow of celibacy, in a sense went beyond the scriptures and opened them up to other forms of sin. We are, we are sexual beings in our design. And so I think requiring all these men to take this vow of celibacy, in a sense, begs the question of where will this, where will this sexual drive find its outlet? Right. Well, I, I think that for a long time, what you had internally in the institution was uh, a people who they look at themselves and they say, look, we are well-versed in church. Uh, and, and so who are you on the outside, whether you be media, uh, lawyers, whoever, to, to tell us what we need to be doing? You know, we, we simply, we know better, I guess is a good way to put that. They have at least moved beyond we know better. The problem is they don't know where they're going. Yeah, yeah. It, it, they're recognizing they have a problem, but they have no, it, it, the appearance is they have no idea really how to handle the problem. I mean, it is a right thing to do, to do to recognize there is a problem. But at the same point, you got to have your Bible open to, to path your way through. How do we deal with this? When, when we talked about the, the number of people, though, who, who are serving and uh, they are practicing right. homosexuals, and some of them may just be heterosexuals, but they're also practicing when you reference the fact that, that you know, that, that they're supposed to be celibate, uh, that I'm sure that a lot of these people are working counter to anyone trying to solve the issue uh, and it's like any large bureaucracy. Someone can slow it down if they intend to do it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Just just put enough uh, an, enough of an effort to slow the process down so you don't really have to ever address the issue. Uh, look, yeah. Deal with all the peripheral issues, but never deal with the root of the problem. Here's yeah. the thing, is the most challenging and the most difficult thing for anyone to do in this situation is to humble themselves and repent. But repentance is such a good thing. It's a soul-cleansing thing. It's a way of humbling ourselves before Jesus Christ and saying, here I am, I'm a mess, and I've sinned. And, and us pastors, we, we're sinners. Right. And we do that every day where we come before Christ and we say, I, I've sinned. Will you forgive me? And we plead the blood of Christ. And, but people don't want to do that. And, and that's kind of the riddle and the paradox when you say, well, this is the cure. Why don't you want this? I've heard it said, you know, that the holiness of your people will never rise above the leadership. And it's one of those things where in Rome, I mean, if there's not holiness from the top, it's right. not going to trickle down to the people. We've got a caller. Caller, you're up next on Pastor's Roundtable. Good morning, gentlemen. Good program this morning. Thank you. Um, I'd like to go back and hit the Idaho Abortion Rights Act. Um, I think one of the things that we've lost touch with in our state government and our federal government is the people that we elect and send to the legislator, legislature are representatives. They aren't our leaders. Right. And Good they point. have put themselves in that position, and we have put them in that position. And we shouldn't be looking to them so much for leadership as for representation of what the people want. Right. I, yeah. I totally agree. There, there's no possible way that every one of us could go to the state house and vote on every issue. So we elect a representative to go do it that, for us. That represents the people of their constituency, you know, of right. that area. Yeah. We want to thank you for the call. We'll squeeze one last caller in here. We're coming up on 955. Caller, you're next. You're on the air on KLIX. Morning, guys. One thing I've been watching and seeing and kind of curious about, too, is with the uh, some of the bigger denominations having the issues they seem to be having is will we be seeing a time when people, I guess this can go both ways, um, but will we be seeing people turn more to seeking God themselves and reading their Bible and maybe not congregating as much and some of the churches that they've grown up in 
speak, I'm kind of speaking from experience myself too here, but uh, where people maybe hopefully will be coming back to seek God uh, a little bit more than they were. Yeah, you know, I, th- I think that we've already seen, even before these, these big problems begin to show up in the big denominations, that there's already been a, 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 a pattern of people wanting to just go out and search religion on their own. And there's a great danger in doing that and not, in not affiliating, not fellowshipping with other believers, not putting ourselves under the corporate authority of the Word of God. And so the, the, the individual certainly has a relationship with God, but we can never pursue it absent from the commands of God, and that one of those is the gathering with saints. Because Jesus died for the church. He's the right. head of the church. Exactly. And, and that's the institution that he has left. Now, when we talk about church, we're not talking about building. We're talking about right. those who have been called out People. by his grace. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. And So that is significant. Just to, something else to the callers I mentioned. Um, people are going to worship something. Right. Either themselves, whatever ideology they want, or they're going to come and worship God. Right. And so it's, it's a matter of you getting in and finding a church. You're not going to find a perfect church, but getting into a church that's going to teach the scriptures. That's right. I mean, in response to that gentleman, I think what I hear him saying is people want a church where the truth is esteemed and revered as an authoritative word of God. And I would encourage anyone out there listening, find a church. If you don't have a church where the word of God is, is faithfully dealt with as an authoritative, inspired word of God, Come visit one of our churches. I trust these brothers here. Um, come to one of our churches where the Bible is open, and we say, thus says the Lord. Right. Yeah, Chris, you're exactly right. If you're at a church and the, and the Bible's never opened, and whether it's with an electronic Bible or, or an actual physical book, uh, if the book is not open, you're not you're not in a church that's going to feed you the scripture. The word and I would God. say not just open, but faithfully, faithfully in the faithfully text. teach. Because how many times do people right. say, "Oh, here's the scripture that we're going to spring off of"? <laughs> right. You get into the word. It's living. It's active. It's sharp and two-edged sword. <laughs> get into the scripture. Oh, we got to wrap. But I wanted to point out, you can tell just by how well worn these Bibles are <laughs> that they get a lot of use. <laughs> we have to. Say goodbye for the day, and I do want to thank the pastors for dropping in today, and we'll do this again next week. And uh, I wanted to mention, of course, Rush Limbaugh's program is coming up. We're at 958, and it's 40 on News Radio 1310, KLIX, com. Bill Colley saying, God willing, in the creek don't rise. I'll be back here tomorrow morning between 6 and 10 a.m.